thank you, Rava, who's the guest today, is actually someone who teaches people on basic concepts of investing and many other concepts as well. So he's very good in what he does. He's actually very knowledgeable. If you actually go through the Twitter thread, I, I'm not sure you're going to need a university degree after going through his Twitter threads. So uh, he's here today to talk, uh, talk to us about uh, uh, financial statements. Uh, so you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Thank you so much. Uh, so that was a very nice introduction. Thank you. So this talk is going to be about understanding financial statements. As investors, uh, we need to know what companies we own and why we own them. And we need to figure out what the economics of these companies look like. And we have to be able to understand those economics really, really well if we want to invest in companies. And how do we understand the economics of businesses? Uh, well, by reading their financial statements. One of the most important ways to understand a business, uh, understand how money moves in and out of the business is to look at its financial statements. So this talk is about how exactly we do that, how, how to take a business's financial statements and figure out what these financial statements are telling us about the nature of the business, its economics, its uh, return on capital, what uh, economic characteristics it has, things like that. So uh, my name is Denke Diver, and um, I have this Twitter account and I write a bunch of threads there. And uh, so this is how I got to know Chubby and Chubby invited me on, on here to talk about financial statements. So that, that's what we are going to do today. Exactly right. So we have the balance sheet, the income statement and the cash flow statement. Those, those are the three financial statements. And so in the next few slides, we'll talk about what each one of them is and uh, what they tell us about the business. So before that, there's something called a state versus a flow uh, picture. So state means something that's calculated at one particular point in time. So for example, at the end of a particular quarter or at the end of a particular year or something like that, you take one specific point in time and then you calculate some things at that point in time, and that gives you the state of the company. Uh, then there is something called a flow. A flow is basically, you don't do it at one point in time, you take two points in time. You take one time interval, and then you figure out, okay, what happened to the company during this time interval between these two time points? So for example, the last quarter or the last year or the last five years, what happened to the company between uh, during this time interval. So if you look at our three financial statements, uh, one of them reports on the state of a company at a particular point in time. And the other two report on the flow that happened in the company during a time interval. So which one is the state and which two are the, are the flow? So, so the balance sheet tells you uh, what are all the assets and liabilities that the company has at a particular point in time? So at the end of the last quarter or at the end of the last year or something like that. So the balance sheet tells us what the state of the company is at a particular point. Whereas the income statement tells us, okay, what, what, what is the revenue that the company had during a particular quarter or during a particular year? Cash flow statement, same thing. What is the uh, change in cash during a particular year or something like that? So cash flow statement and income statement are flows whereas the balance sheet is a state. That's the key difference between the balance sheet and the other two statements. Okay, so when you look at a balance sheet, balance sheet has uh, three main areas in the balance sheet. So one is the assets side of the balance sheet. And then we have uh, the, the liability side of the balance sheet. And there is the shareholders equity. Uh, so what happens is with, with the company, when uh, the company sells, uh, say, say Tesla or uh, some, some, some company, let's, let's say it, it sells products to customers, but then uh, it does not collect the cash from customers right away. Maybe it collects the cash from customers later. So when that happens, when the products are sold for credit instead of for cash, then what happens is the company has receivables. Receivables is basically, if, if I sell you 
um, say, I don't know, a, a computer for hundred dollars, but then I tell you that, uh, okay, you can pay me one month later, then that hundred dollars is my receivable because I, I still have to collect that from you. Uh, so so that, that is an asset on my balance sheet. It's not cash because I don't have the hundred dollars in cash, but it's a uh, hundred dollars in receivables and that that is an asset on the balance sheet. Okay, so what are some, some common liabilities? You have suppliers, you have uh, wages payable, you have long-term debt, you have deferred taxes, prepaid revenue, all, all these things uh, are uh, liabilities on, uh, on the balance sheet. Uh, and then finally, there is this uh, section called shareholders equity, which is basically the, the assets minus the liabilities. So whatever uh, the total assets that the company has, minus all the liabilities that it owes to various uh, constituents that forms the, the shareholders equity. And the shareholders equity is made up of two components, which is essentially what is the money that was contributed to start the business, which is paid in capital. And then how much money has been retained by the business over a period of time uh, since when it was started, which is retained earnings. So if you, if you take the assets, and uh, you subtract out the liabilities, you will get shareholders equity. Or another way to say it, it is assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity. And because assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity, the balance sheet has to balance. So on the, on the left side, uh, everything on the left side must add up to everything on the right side. It must be balanced. So that's, that's why it's called a balance sheet. So uh, that, this tells us about the state of the business at a particular point in time. Okay, let's, let's, let's go to the income statement. So income statement is basically uh, what happened to the business, how much money the business made over a period of time. So in the last quarter or in the last one year or something like that. So we have revenues, every, every business has revenues. So for example, App, Apple makes revenues by selling iPhones, Tesla makes revenues by selling cars, uh, Starbucks makes revenues by selling coffee, so on. So whenever a business has sales, uh, th those things count as revenues. But in addition to revenues, a business has a whole bunch of costs associated with it. So um, when, when Starbucks uh, sells, sells coffee, it costs Starbucks some amount of money to get the coffee and buy the, uh, buy the coffee beans and run the stores and things like that. So Starbucks has costs. Uh, so if you take the revenues and you subtract out all the costs, that's what you're left with is the profits of the company. And um, if you take those profits and divide by the number of shares, that gives you the profits per share or the earnings per share or EPS. So a report of, okay, over this pe period of time, this quarter or this year or this five years or what, whatever, some period of time, these are all the revenues that the company made and these are all the costs that the company incurred. And so revenues minus cost that is the profit that the company made during this period. A report that gives you all this information, that report is basically called the income statement. So uh, what are some of the costs that companies can have? Can so the, the, these are all the various kinds of costs companies have. So uh, there is uh, all, the, all these different things. Cost of goods sold is exactly uh, what, what it costs to uh, buy raw materials. And then depreciation, which is uh, essentially what the company has spent investing in uh, property, plant, equipment, all, all this stuff. So when, when a company goes and opens a factory for uh, say $1 billion, uh, now it, it doesn't take the entire $1 billion that, as a cost straight away. So if the factory is going to be useful for the next 10 years, then what happens is it takes that $1 billion, divides by 10 and takes a $100 million cost each year for those 10 years. And so this depreciation is a special kind of cost. It's called a non-cash cost because uh, the, the cash was already spent when, when the company built the factory in, in the first year. But then for the next 10 years, the company takes a charge uh, on its income statement. And so that, that is not really a cash cost, but it's definitely a cost because it, it did cost money to build that factory. So that's, that's depreciation and all, all these other expenses. So this is, this is the nature of the income statement. This is what an income statement tells us. So over a period of time, what are the revenues? What are the costs? What are the profits? And so we have earnings per share. Okay, uh, so there are two important things in an income statement. So if you just take the cost of goods sold 
and you take revenues minus the cost of goods sold, that's called gross profit. And then if you subtract out all these other costs, depreciation, sales and marketing, everything except interest and taxes, that gets you the operating profit. And then finally, once you take out the interest and taxes as well, that gets you the final profit or net income of the company. So it's just a gross profit and operating profit are two, two things to, uh, two terms to remember when you're analyzing an income statement. Okay, so the, the last statement is the cash flow statement. And in my experience, of the three statements, whenever I try to explain uh, the financial statements to people, the cash flow statement is the most confusing statement. People just don't understand the cash flow statement as well as they understand the income statement or the balance sheet or something like that. And the reason uh, why it is so confusing is that most people, when they think of profits, they think of cash. So if a company made $1 billion in profits, then it, it must have $1 billion of cash with it, right? Uh, so, so if the company initially, suppose it had $0, and then it said, I made $1 billion of profit, then now how much cash should the company have? The company should have $1 billion of cash, right? Because that's the profit it made. But unfortunately, in most companies, it doesn't work like that. Just because a company made uh, some profit doesn't mean the company has that much of cash available. So the increase in cash is not the same as the profit the company made. They are two very different things. And we'll see why in a minute. Uh, so basically what the cash flow statement does is it tells you why the change in cash is not equal to the income. So if, if the company made $1 of profit, maybe uh, the cash increased by only half a dollar. Or maybe the cash increased by $2, even though the company made only $1 of profit. So why? Why exactly is it that net income is different from increase in cash? Why is this difference? That is what the cash flow statement tries to tell you. Why there is a difference between these two? Well, the first reason why uh, net income is different from uh, increase in cash is there are a large number of non-cash costs associated with running a business. So, um, uh, for example, we, we had this, uh, this thing called depreciation, right? So we said, we are going to, um, we, we build a factory, but then we are going to subtract the cost of that factory over the next 10 years. We are not going to subtract it out uh, in the first year itself. We are going to subtract it out over the next 10 years. But the factory, the cash that was used to build the factory that went out the door in year one, in the, in the very first year. But still, what we are doing is we are taking out little by little the cash uh, that is used to build the factory in each uh, subsequent year from years, say, 2 to 11 or something like that. So when we subtract out this cash, uh, so net income is calculated after subtracting out this cash. and so. Uh, if you look at that particular cost, the depreciation cost, it's a cost that was subtracted out from net income, but that cost did not really result in any cash being spent by the company this year. It was for some cash that was spent in some previous year, which is not uh, this year's focus. So what we have to do is we have to take all these costs, which are not cash costs, which are non-cash costs, and we have to add them back to net income because net income already subtracted them. So we now have to add them back if you want to find out how much cash the company has. So one, one important non-cash cost is depreciation. Can somebody tell me what another important non-cash cost is? Amortization. Uh, amortization. Sure, amortization is is a is a non cash cost, but depreciation, amortization, mo mostly they're the same thing. I mean, if if you if you take a fixed asset and you depreciate it, uh, that's called depreciation. But if you take a, an intangible asset and you depreciate that, it's called amortization. It's the yeah, they um, depreciation, amortization. They are both non cash costs, but they are roughly the same thing. So I'm I'm grouping them both together as depreciation. What is some other other non cash cost? Uh, 
and depletion. Uh, sure, depletion. So did you get that? Yeah, uh, de depletion is um, it's it's also kind of related to to depreciation. Okay, so so anyway, the 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 thing that I am thinking of is stock based compensation. So a uh, lot of companies these days, if you look at their uh, cash flow statement, uh, they will report. Uh, they, they may even report a negative income, but they will report a positive cash flow. And the reason why is because uh, they have a lot of stock-based compensation. So stock-based compensation is when uh, a business takes uh, its employees and it issues new stock in itself and it gives them to employees. So if Apple uh, issues new shares of Apple and gives them to Tim Cook, then uh, that, that is basically a stock-based compensation. And so it doesn't cost the company any anything to issue shares and then give give it to employees. So that that is a non. Uh, it does not cost the company anything in cash uh, to to do that. But then uh, it, it's going to hurt the company in the long run because it's going to hurt the owners of the company because their stake in the company is going to become uh, diluted over a period of time if the company. Uh, gives enormous amount of stock options to employees and things like that, what's going to happen is that uh, existing shareholders are going to be diluted uh, because of this. And uh, so that is a non-cash cost. And that has to be subtracted uh, 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 to arrive at net income. So net income already includes this non-cash cost, which was subtracted. So that has to be added back uh, to, to get uh, the cash, uh, how, much, how much the cash increased in a company. Uh, the next thing is uh, increase in working capital. So, uh, supp suppose I sold. Uh, I'm a suppose I'm a business. Okay, so I, I sell um, say uh, computer parts or something like that. So I, I sold a, uh, a bunch of computer parts to you, and uh, let's say I sold uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of computer parts to you. But then uh, you you told me that you'll pay me back in uh, in say six months time. So I sold you those $100,000 uh, of computer parts on uh, credit. So I may say, okay, I sold these $100,000 worth of computer parts and those computer parts, parts only cost me $80,000. So $20,000 is my profit because I bought them for uh, 80,000 and then I sold, sold them for 100,000. So now my profit is 20,000, but has my cash increased or not? No, I, I don't have the 20,000 in cash. I will have the 20,000 in cash only when you pay me for the computer parts, right? So until you pay me, I don't have cash, but it's income. So this $100,000, it's, it's counted as income, but it doesn't actually uh, constitute an increase in cash. So uh, this, this thing, which is part of income, but it's not. Uh, part of cash has to be subtracted out from income if I want to figure out what the uh, what the cash is. So what what would have happened is when I sold you the computer parts for um, uh, hundred thousand dollars, what would have happened is uh, the the working capital, uh, so my receivables would have increased uh, by by hundred thousand dollars because I sold you those parts for uh, hundred thousand, but my cash has not increased by hundred thousand. So uh, whatever uh, increase in working capital, that has to be subtracted out from net income. And so uh, net income plus, plus non-cash costs minus the increase in uh, working capital like receivables, inventory, and things like that, uh, that is called cash flow from operations. Now, of course, uh, that's not the whole story because every company, it's going to make some investments uh, to grow the company. So uh, just as we had this depreciation cost, what, what exactly is this depreciation cost? It, it comes from some investment that was made many years ago. So just like an investment was made many years ago, the company can make investments today also. So uh, the company may uh, go and decide to buy a, uh, build, build a new factory today. Uh, so for example, Tesla recently opened this, this factory in, in Germany, which cost it a lot of money. So all these investments for growth, uh, which, which are not considered uh, as net income, 
those investments have to be subtracted out because every time a company makes an investment of $1, $1 of cash uh, goes out the door. But that $1 is not counted as net income or anything like that. It, it will be counted in net income when that $1 is depreciated over a period of time, but it's not counted as net income right now. So all that cash that goes out of the door when a company does uh, investments, that has to be subtracted out uh, from, uh, from, from this net income. So, uh, so essentially that, that's, that's what we have here. We have uh, investments which are in the form of capital expenses, which is like a company building a new factory or, or something like that. Uh, the other, other kind of uh, investment is when one company goes and buys another company. So uh, if, if, uh, if a particular company uh, go goes and buys another company for $100 million, now that $100 million is not treated as an expense or anything. It's not part of net income or anything like that. But if it pays for that acquisition in cash, it's a $100 million decrease in cash, right? So that has to be counted when you're trying to reconcile net income to cash. So uh, once you take out uh, these two, uh, capital expenses and acquisitions, what we are left, it, uh, left with is called free cash flow. Uh, so is free cash flow equal to increase in cash? So, so free cash flow is very close to increase in cash, but it is not equal to increase in cash. And the reason why is because, um, so let's say a company like Starbucks, it, it made one, $1 billion or, or let's, let's say it made $1 billion in, in free cash flow. But suppose it took, 500 million of that 1 billion and gave it to shareholders as a dividend. Now, now what happens? Now, um, it made the $1 billion and that $1 billion resulted in an increase in cash, but now 500 million of that cash is gone. So free cash flow is still 1 billion, but the increase in cash on the balance sheet is not 1 billion, it's only 500 million because it already gave the 500 million to uh, the owners of the company, right? So. Uh, that, that's the thing. When, when, when a company has uh, distributions, uh, so which could be um, dividends or uh, buybacks, so Starbucks can go and buy back shares. When it uses its free cash flow for dividends or buybacks, what happens is that uh, cash is actually going to decrease. So if Starbucks made $1 billion and then uh, it spent $500 million on dividends and then uh, spent another $500 million doing buybacks, then the increase in cash is actually zero, even though free cash flow is one billion, right? So there's a, there's a difference. So free cash flow is not equal to increase in cash. Uh, so you have these distributions. Uh, then there is this other uh, final effect, which is new capital raises. So suppose Starbucks made $1 billion, but then um, it, it, let's say Starbucks made 1 billion in free cash flow, but then it went and borrowed another 2 billion from the market. Now what has happened is it now has $3 billion of cash because the 1 billion that it made already in free cash flow, plus this extra 2 billion, which it has gone and borrowed, right? So that's not part of net income or anything. That's just money that Starbucks went and borrowed. So that also has to be counted uh, when you want to figure out how much cash increased. So uh, if a company went and borrowed money, that will increase its cash. Uh, but that's not net income or free cash flow or anything like that. That's just borrowed money. Similarly, if, if the company decided to pay off money that it has borrowed. So if the company decided uh, that it's going to reduce its amount of debt, and so it goes and uses that $1 billion to pay off debt, then cash goes down by $1 billion because that money is used to pay off debt. So again, you have all these things where uh, when, when a company pays off debt, cash reduces. When a company issues debt, cash increases, but those things are not part of key free cash flow and they have to be added to free cash flow to finally arrive at uh, this, this increase in cash. So that's why the cash flow statement is such a complicated thing. You see, it, it's got so many parts. It's, it's the most confusing statement because first of all, you know, it, it takes all these costs and adds them back to net income. Normally what we do with costs is we subtract costs, but the, the cash flow statement, it adds the costs. Why does it add costs? Because these are non-cash costs. So they have to be added back to net income. 
then it subtracts out the increase in working capital then it subtracts out all these investments it's it's a complicated statement to understand so uh, that that's the thing when when a company issues new debt then that increases the amount of cash in the company but that new debt is not really free cash flow or anything like that uh, so that new debt which the company issued has to be added to free cash flow to get the increase in cash right so th th those are the th uh, the the factors that we have to consider so the cash flow statement is kind of the most confusing statement uh, mainly because it has so many moving parts to it so we have we have net income we have all this uh, non cash costs we have increases in working capital investments for growth so the cash flow statement essentially takes all this and puts it together but if you remember this main concept which is that what is the purpose of the cash flow statement it is to explain why net income is not equal to increase in cash so if you treat this entire cash flow statement as this explanation for why net income and increase in cash were not the same thing then you can understand the cash flow statement much better so um so the question says stock based compensation how can it, is it normally found in the income statement or what is it called on the income statement or uh, in the assets on, column of the balance sheet what okay this one is the, the second i think this is two questions one is how do you find uh, the stock based compensation that we mentioned earlier and then okay. the second one is where you see securities on the balance sheet because we, we are done with the balance sheet but there are places you dimension securities that what exactly does it mean? Okay, so there are two different questions. So the first question is stock-based compensation. So stock-based compensation is uh, deducted from the income statement. So in the income statement, we had revenues and costs, right? So uh, if, you, if you take all the costs that a company has, cost of goods sold and uh, general and administrative costs and all that, uh, Stock-based compensation is actually included in that general and administrative costs and uh, uh, R&D costs and things like that. So, for example, let's say Apple. Uh, Apple goes and pays uh, uh, the uh, Apple employs plenty of research scientists, right? They're designing the iPhones and they do R&D and all that. So, if you have an engineer at Apple, and that engineer is being paid partly in stock and partly in cash by Apple then uh, whatever the work that engineer does, that uh, the, the money that the engineer is paid for that is a cost to Apple. So uh, it is counted as an R&D cost because that engineer is working on R&D. So it, it's an R&D cost, but part of the cost is cash cost and part of it is stock-based compensation. But if you look at Apple's income statement, it will say research and development expenses so much, so many billion dollars. Now, some of that is cash, but some of that is also stock. So cash and stock, uh, stock-based compensation are, are kind of bundled together uh, in the income statement. But if you go and look at the cash flow statement, it will tell you exactly how much was stock-based compensation because stock-based compensation is a non-cash cost. Whereas cash uh, expenses uh, paid to employees, cash salaries and things like that are cash costs. So in the cash flow statement, what happens is you have to add just the non-cash cost back to net income. So stock-based compensation is a non-cash cost. So you will see the stock-based compensation as a separate line item in the cash flow statement. You won't see it as a separate line item in most income statements. And the, the second question was uh, ab about the balance sheet. What, what exactly do securities mean on the balance sheet? So um, when, a, when a company has, um, uh, so, so companies like Apple, for example, that, that have a lot of cash on their balance sheet, they don't like to keep it all in, in cash. So uh, so, sometimes they like to invest in, in a bunch of corporate bonds or something like that. And so what they do is they, they have not just cash, but they also have marketable securities. So these, these are, uh, th there's something called, there's one line item called cash and cash equivalents. And then there is a second line item called marketable securities, which the company also has. Uh, so marketable securities are essentially bonds and uh, 
uh, uh, deposits that, that the company has that being, uh, accounted for at market value. So that, those are the securities on the balance sheet. Sometimes what you have to do is you have to take uh, different numbers from different uh, statements and then put them together to calculate some uh, ratios and things like that. So these are called key metrics that investors rely on to try and tell them how the company is doing. So for example, revenue growth may be one key metric. So I have this key metric listed here. It's the current year's revenue minus last year's revenue because you want the growth, right? <laughs> so uh, it, exactly. So th the thing is, where do you get these revenue from? Which statement, which financial statement gives you these revenues? So if you want to calculate revenue growth, this is what you do. You, you take the this year's income statement, you take the previous year's income statement and you compare the two. And then this year's income statement will have a revenue line. The previous year's income statement will also have a revenue line. You take uh, this revenue minus the previous revenue, and that 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 is the that gives you the revenue growth for for the company. So, if revenue growth is a key metric that you are interested in, if you want to invest only in companies that have a good revenue growth, then you have to get that from the income statement. Now, suppose you want to figure out how much cash was returned to owners of the company. So. Uh, one of what the, the, the main purpose of a company is to make profits and return cash to its owners, right? Companies run for the benefit of the owners of the company. So, if I want to figure out, okay, how much cash was returned by this company to its owners in the last one year, say, uh, how, do, how do I figure that out? So, if you, if you look at a company, suppose a company made, say, uh, one billion dollars of profit, and then out of this one billion dollars, Suppose it took 800 million. Let's say all this 1 billion was made in cash, okay? Now, of this $1 billion, let's say it took $800 million and then returned that 800 million to owners as dividends. So it gave 800 million to its owners. Now, what happens to the remaining 200 million? So the company made 1 billion in cash and then it returned 800 million. So what happens to the remaining 200 million? That 200 million goes and sits in shareholders equity. Okay, so that, that increase in shareholders equity is essentially whatever the cash the company made, which it did not distribute to owners. But that's not what I'm interested in calculating. I, in, in this particular key metric, I'm asking how much of it was actually returned to owners, not how much of it was not returned to owners, right? So if I want to figure out just how much was returned to the owners, where should I look? So, so if you want to find out how much cash was returned to owners, you just look at the dividends and buybacks on the cash flow statement. Uh, so the cash flow statement, uh, after free cash flow, it will give you a line saying, okay, of the amount of free cash flow that we reported, we, we spent so much on dividends and so much on buybacks. And so if, if we reported say 100 million in free cash flow, and then returned 20 million through dividends, the increase in cash will be only 80 million, not 100 million, because 20 million of it was already returned to owners. And if you want to figure out how much was returned to owners, you have to look at the cash flow statement to, to figure it out. That, that's the answer. Okay, so, so the th third thing is, how much capital does the business need to run? So every business, uh, so, some businesses have lots of assets. Uh, some, some businesses don't have much in the way of assets at all. Some businesses need to keep a lot of inventory. Other businesses have no inventory. So, um, so if, if you want to figure out what are all the assets a business needs to run, uh, how much capital is required by the business, where will you look? Which statement? Um, whatever the business needs to run. So some, some businesses, they don't have very much working capital, but they have a huge amount of fixed assets. Uh, other businesses, they have no fixed assets, but they have a lot of working capital. So businesses need both, both kinds of capital to run. And if you want to figure out how much capital the business needs and what, what, what kind of capital is it? Is it fixed assets or is it working capital? You, you look at the assets on the balance sheet. Uh, the next thing is, okay, so let's say a business needs $1 billion to run. Now, where exactly does this $1 billion come from? 
So how, how did the business get this $1 billion, which it needs to run? So if I want to find that out, where, where will I look? The ca cash flow statement may have nothing about, um, so, so the, if, if you just look at uh, what, one year's worth of cash flow statement, it may it may tell you nothing about where the capital in the business comes from, right? Because um, you know uh, the, the 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 capital uh, may have been contributed in some some previous year, right? Right. It's 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 the balance sheet. So you have to look at the liability side of the balance sheet. Uh, so the asset side of the balance sheet tells you how much capital the business needs to run. How much inventory does it need? How much it has in receivables? What kinds of fixed assets uh, are required? All that. But if you look at the liability side of the balance sheet, it will tell you where exactly all these assets are coming from, where exactly all this capital is coming from. So one, one way that companies raise capital is by borrowing money. So uh, part of the liabilities are, are just debt that the company has borrowed. So debt is one way the business can raise capital. The other uh, way a business can raise capital is through equity. So, um, you know, when, when the company did an IPO or something like that, it raised capital. And uh, that capital, the equity capital in the business was actually contributed by the owners of the business. And then uh, the company added to, may have added to that equity capital through retained earnings and so on. So the equity is part of the liability side of the balance sheet, liabilities and shareholders equity. And then in addition to that, a company may get capital from its employees. It may get capital from its suppliers. It may get capital from its customers. It may get capital from the government. Uh, so all, all this kind of capital that it gets is called float capital. So this is not the capital that was actually contributed uh, into the business by the owners of the business. This is the capital that that comes to the business from various other people the business interacts with, like suppliers and customers and so on. So if you want to figure out where all the capital in the business is coming from, who contributed this capital, you have to look at the liability side of the balance sheet. Okay, so operating leverage. So uh, first of all, what, what is operating leverage and how do we calculate operating leverage? Uh, but operating leverage is not exactly the same as debt. So what operating leverage means is, uh, suppose a company wants to grow its profits. Okay, so, so let's say a company wants to double its profits. Th this year, the company made $1 billion. Next year, it wants to make $2 billion. It wants to double its profits. Now the question is, uh, of course, the company has to increase its revenues. If, you're, if it wants to increase profits, it, it has to increase the revenues. But how much does it have to increase revenues? If, if the profits have to double, should the revenues double as well? Or should the revenues, uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter. The revenues don't have to double. If the revenues increase by 50%, that's enough for the profits to double. So when the growth in profits is faster than the growth in revenue, that's called operating leverage. Uh, so, so a lot of companies, uh, when, when, they, when they have more revenue, when revenue increases by say 20%, profits don't increase by 20%. Profits may increase by 50%, uh, even though revenues increase only by 20%. So companies like this, where the profit can grow faster than revenue, uh, those companies are called, uh, that, that's called operating leverage. So those companies have operating leverage. But if, uh, if your revenues increase a lot and your profits still don't increase very much, then you don't have operating leverage. So if you want to find out whether a company has operating leverage or not, uh, where will you look? Exactly, you, you look at the income statement. So you figure out how, how quickly revenues are growing by comparing uh, the income statement from last year to this year or something. Uh, you figure out how quickly profits are growing by comparing last year's profit to this year's profit. And then you figure out whether the growth in revenue is faster or the growth in profit is faster. If the growth in profit is faster than the growth in revenue, then the company has operating leverage. Otherwise, the company does not have operating leverage. So you, you look at the income statement. Exactly. Okay. Then we have inventory turnover. It's, it's like this. So if, if I have say uh, $5 of capital, okay? 
let's say I'm a grocery store and I'm using this $5 to go and buy a cabbage, okay? So I'll buy this cabbage and then say two days later, I will sell this cabbage for $6. So that means what I have done is I have turned my inventory in two days. So uh, if, I, if I have uh, $5, I, I invested $5 into buying this cabbage, but then I sold this cabbage for $6. And then now I can take that $6 and buy another cabbage and then sell that again uh, in another two days. So every two days, what I'm doing is I'm making one, one dollar by, by buying a cabbage and then selling a cabbage two days later. I'm making one dollar every two days for the same amount of capital, for the same five dollars that I invested into the business. So I'm, I'm not investing anything new into the business. It's the same five dollars. I'm just recycling it again and again and again. So every two days, I'm buying a cabbage for $5 and selling it for $6. So companies that can do this, companies that can achieve very fast inventory turnover, if they can turn their inventory over every few days, uh, they can achieve a high degree of return for the same amount of capital that is invested into the business uh, because it's the capital that is being recycled over and over again. So uh, the, the way you measure inventory turnover is, well, first of all, you have to kind of figure out how much profit you're making. Uh, so, uh, so, what, what, what is, uh, so what is the total cost of goods sold? So if I, if I want to figure out uh, how often I'm turning over my inventory, is it every two days or is it every 10 days or what, uh, how, how often am I turning over my inventory? Then uh, what I have to do is I have to look at the income statement because the income statement will tell me what my cost of goods sold is. So cost of goods sold, so if I, if I sell my inventory every two days, what's going to happen is my cost of goods sold, uh, which is the cost of all the cabbages I sold. I'm, I'm selling cabbages every two days. So the cost of all the cabbages that I sold is going to be $5 per cabbage times uh, 180 times per year, right? So that's, that's the cost of goods sold for my business. So that that is a nine hundred nine hundred dollars. That is, uh, that's my cost of goods sold. Now, if you look at the inventory that I have, that's only five dollars because that's just uh, one cabbage. So, my cost of goods sold is nine hundred dollars, but the inventory I have is only five dollars. So, if I take my cost of goods sold and divide it by the inventory that will tell me how many times I'm turning over my inventory per year. So if I take this $900 and divide it by my $5, I get $180, uh, or I get 180 times. So I am turning over my inventory 180 times per year, which is the same as saying I'm turning it over every two days. So uh, what we have to do is we have to take both the cost of goods sold and then divide it by the inventory. So cost of goods sold will come from the income statement. Inventory will come from the balance sheet. So you have to look at both the income statement and the balance sheet if you want to calculate inventory turnover. So it's not just looking at one financial statement. You have to look at two different financial statements. You have to take one number from one financial statement, take the second number from the second financial statement, and then divide one by the other, and then you will get inventory turnover. So Investors calculate metrics like this by looking at multiple financial statements at the same time, not just one at a time. Okay, what, what, what about dilution? So if, if I want to calculate uh, how much a company is diluting its shareholders uh, by, uh, by stock-based compensation and things like that, how, how do I calculate that? If you want to find the number of shares, you have to look at the income statement, not the balance sheet. So, so that's, that's what you have to do. You have to look at the number of shares from the income statement. But here's the thing. The number of shares can increase or decrease because of any number of factors, not just dilution. So uh, if, if a company issues a lot of shares and gives it to employees as stock-based compensation, sure, that will increase the number of shares. But then the company can go and buy back shares. And so now what happens? That decreases the number of shares. So now you may have a company that's... Uh, diluting shareholders, but then also buying back shares at the same time. And so what happens is one effect cancels out the other effect 
and so uh, the number of shares doesn't change at all. Uh, but the company is still diluting its shareholders because it's using valuable dollars to buy back these shares. But then these shares, uh, these dollars are not going to decrease the number of shares. They are just use, uh, being used to offset the stock-based compensation. So when looking at the number of shares, it's also equally important to look at the buybacks that the company is doing. And you can look at the buybacks from the cash flow statement. So then you have to figure out, okay, if the company said it's doing this much of buybacks, uh, what, how much should the number of shares have decreased because of the buybacks? And if the number of shares has not decreased that much, uh, the, the reason for that is that while the company is doing buybacks, it's also doing uh, dilution. So you, you kind of have to look at both the cash flow statement and the income statement uh, to try and figure out uh, whether uh, the, the dilution uh, is significant or not. So, so it's, you have to look at both, both statements. Uh, and then finally, uh, let's say we, we, we have debt coverage. So uh, what, first of all, what, what is debt coverage and which statements should we look at to figure out debt coverage? Well, <laughs> so, so the debt is on the balance sheet, that, that's correct. But the debt coverage is, it, it's again a combination of multiple statements because see, if, if you want to figure out whether a company can pay off its debt, you have to figure out whether the company can pay off both, not just the, the principal, but also the interest on the debt, right? So where do you get the interest expense from? You get the interest expense from the in income statement. And then you have to figure out what the principal repayments are. So for that, you have to look at, uh, well, you, you actually have to look at the notes to the financial statements to figure out when the debt is coming due. So based on when the debt is coming due and based on, the interest expenses on the income statement, you can figure out whether the company is able to generate enough cash to meet both its principal obligations and its interest obligations. So debt coverage is actually a complicated thing. It's not just looking at one financial statement and figuring it out. You have to look at uh, various kinds of things. You, you have to look at operating cash flow. So you have to figure out whether the company can generate enough cash. But then most companies, when they generate operating cash flow, they also have to spend money on CapEx uh, to, to put that money back into the business to offset depreciation or whatever. So you have to look at really operating cash flow minus the CapEx. If that is much more than what is required to pay off the interest and the principal, then you can say that the company has good debt coverage. Otherwise, the company does not have good uh, debt coverage and it's better to stay away from such companies. So, so you have all these different uh, uh, factors. So analysis of financial statements, you can spend a lot of time analyzing financial statements. So it is important to figure out, okay, what does each financial statement tell you? And if you want to calculate specific things, like can a company pay off its debt? or uh, what is the return on capital, or what is operating leverage, uh, or what is inventory turnover. If you want to figure out specific things like this, you have to know which financial statement to go to, which numbers to take from the financial statements, and then what kinds of calculations to do with those numbers. So it is important to not just read each individual financial statement, but also try and analyze the financial statements to figure out all these different metrics. So that, that is kind of what I wanted to cover in, in this talk. Uh, so th thank you all very much. And um, if, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions now. Okay, my question is the last, uh, the last uh, explanation about debt coverage. Uh, you mentioned about three things there, you can hear me. So where do we get those information? Uh, the schedule, the, the, pay, the repayment schedule, and the rest of the work, do we get those information to be sure that this company, they can actually pay back their debts or their, 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 they have a strong debt, debt coverage? Do right. you get my question? Right. Uh, I, I think I get the question. Let me answer it. And then you, you if, if you still have more questions, you can ask me. So 
the first thing when it comes to debt is we have to understand what kind of obligations the company has agreed to when it issued the debt. So for example, if a company issues say $100 million of debt, the first thing to understand is, okay, what exactly, the company got $100 million of cash right now by issuing this debt, but the company has to pay it back. So the most important thing is, okay, when should the company pay back the debt? Is the debt to be paid back one year from now? Is it five years from now, 10 years from now? When is the debt uh, due? And that information is uh, actually present in the notes to the financial statements. It won't be present in the financial statements itself. So you actually have to look at the notes to the financial statement to figure out when the debt is due. The second most important thing about the debt is the interest payments. So the debt may be due only in 10 years from now or 20 years from now, but between now and then, there will be interest payments that are due regularly. So maybe interest payments are due every six months or maybe they are due every year or something like that. So there is one set of interest payments and then there is one set of principal payments. So when is the principal payment due? And when are the interest payments due? And how much is the principal payment? And how much are the interest payments? These are all the things that you have to figure out. Okay, once we figure out all this by looking at the notes to the financial statement and the income statement and all that, once we figure this out, um, we have to figure out whether this business has enough money to make all these payments. So we can tell that, okay, this business has to pay back the 100 million 10 years from now and every year, between now and then it has to pay say $5 million in cash. Now, does the company have $5 million of cash to pay every year? Uh, or uh, can the company make that $5 million of cash within a year? So if a company is making $1 billion of cash, then 5 million is nothing. It can make that interest payment very, very easily. But if a company uh, is struggling, if it, if it makes losses year after year, or uh, if it makes, you know, in one year, it's making 1 million in the next year, it's making 10 million. We don't know whether it, it's going to be able to make this 5 million interest payment or not. Forget about the principal payment, just the interest payment may not be possible. So you have to kind of look at uh, not, not just the uh, notes to the financial statements, not just the interest payments. You have to look at a multitude of different things to figure out whether a company has good debt coverage or not. Uh, the okay. first thing I see in the chat is, can you go over operating leverage again? Uh, yeah. So, so, okay. So businesses have two things. Okay. There's revenue and there's profit. Now, uh, if revenue grows 20%, should profit also grow 20%? Not necessarily. Sometimes revenue can go, grow 20%, but profits can grow 50%. Sometimes revenues can grow 20%, but profits can grow only 5%. Both are possible. So operating leverage basically tells you whether profits are growing faster or revenues are growing faster. If revenues are growing faster than profits, then you don't have operating leverage. If profits are growing faster than revenues, then you do have operating leverage. That's, that's basically what operating leverage is. Let's see. Let's just get to the next question in the chat. I see treasury stock on the balance sheet on the shareholders' equity. How is that different from securities on the balance sheet? Yeah. So uh, treasury stock is stock that the company has in its own shares. Okay. So when when a company uh, issues shares uh, to to raise money or in a in a uh, public offering in an IPO or in a secondary offering or just a stock-based compensation. When a company issues shares and gets paid for shares, uh, that stock goes into treasury stock. But here's the thing. Those are shares of the company itself. So the company can issue any amount of shares anytime it wants. But securities held on the balance sheet are uh, um, like bonds and other things that the, the company owns instead of cash. So it's not its own shares. A company cannot own its own shares and then uh, write that up as securities on the balance sheet. Uh, so when you see uh, cash and cash equivalents and marketable securities on the balance sheet, what it actually means is the company owns a certain amount of corporate bonds or stocks and other companies and so on, 
which it can sell and raise cash in the markets. Uh, those are securities, not its own shares. So, so that's that's the difference between treasury stock and uh, securities on the balance sheet. So, with with rising interest rates, will dilution be expected by companies? Um, I don't immediately see a link between rising interest rates and dilution. So, wh why why would a company increase dilution just because interest rates are increasing? Okay, I think um, for, because of the interest rates increasing, um, debt uh, financing will be much a higher burden for companies. So okay, like, it might be better an for them. To use equity financing. Uh, equity financing, so that they rather right. find it cheaper to dilute than to go and pay higher interest uh, using debt. So yeah, that's so, a good point. Uh, sure. So if uh, well, if, 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 if companies rising. are finding it, yeah, if, if companies are finding it harder and harder to raise debt, um, then, and, and if they need money to expand their operations or whatever, then the only other way instead of raising debt is to raise equity, right? So um, they may, and, and when you raise equity, you dilute existing uh, shareholders. So that is definitely possible. But the thing is, um, at least in the US, interest rates are so low. If, if you look at the historical interest rates, uh, they've been much, much higher than what they are today. So even though interest rates may rise, even after the rise, interest rates are not expected to be very high or anything like that. And inflation is definitely uh, expected to be much higher than uh, the, the interest rates. So I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, even after an increase in interest rates, this is going to tilt the balance uh, in, in favor of uh, equity financing as opposed to debt financing. Uh, simply because interest rates are so low, even if they double or triple, it's still probably far better to issue debt than to issue equity. Uh, so that, of course, that calculation is different for different companies and, some, some companies may be much riskier than others and they may not be able to get the, the low interest rate. So if they are only able to get high interest rates, then sure, they may be forced to issue equity and, and things like that. But by and large, for large, well-run companies, I don't think debt financing should be a problem, even with rising rates. All right, uh, let's take the last one. He says something like, is the second metric also called payout ratio? Uh, right, right. So, so uh, well, it may be a payout ratio. Usually payout ratio is reserved for dividends, right? Uh, so, so if a company makes uh, $1 billion, but then gives 250 million of that 1 billion in, in dividends, then uh, the payout ratio is 25% because it, it made $1 billion and it gave out 25%. But if you uh, look at both the dividends and the buybacks, if you count the buybacks also as cash returned to owners, then uh, that is not the payout ratio. So it depends on how you define how much cash was returned to owners. If you count both dividends and buybacks, then that's not payout ratio. But if you look at just the dividends, then yes, you can call it a payout ratio. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this webinar by the Fundamental Analyst Group. Be sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel for more. If you want to join the Fundamental Analyst Group, drop a message in the comments and I'll get back to you. See you in the next one.